welcome to Central Florida Salute YouTube. I'm your host, Bob Peters, and once again, I'm here in Orlando uh, for the convention for the Vietnam Veterans of America, and I have a dear friend. I don't want to say old friend because we're not getting any older. No. no. But uh, this lady and I, she's a Vietnam veteran, have been, well, we worked on several projects in Connecticut uh, that we're going to talk about. But I, first, I got to try to go over your bio, and the, this, this might take a while because you have done so much, you know. It, uh, like, oh, but fact, I should start with your name, right? Yeah. This is Linda Schwartz. She is the treasurer for the Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, and amongst other things you've done. But uh, Linda is uh, a dedicated advocate for the healing of the wounds of war. She is an RN, an MSN, a Dr. PH, a FAAN. I have no idea what any of that is. All right, so do you want me to tell you? Yeah, sure. All right, so. What is, yeah, I mean, all this. All the, okay. Yeah, you're RN a registered nurse. Registered. I got that part. All right, and MSN means I have my master's in nursing. And then I got a doctorate in public health. And then, I was uh, invested in the American Academy of Nurses. That's what, I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Nurses. You're an amazing lady, I'll tell you I'm what. A jolly I've good always fellow. told you that, you were an amazing lady. <laughs> but uh, like I said before, you're uh, healing the wounds of war. That's it's more of a philosophy with you, right? Right. You want to explain that? Well, um, in a way, it, I do not limit myself to one aspect of the de veteran experience, uh, including their families, okay? So during the, the Gulf War, I live in a small town out in the middle of nowhere, and um, a young wife of a Marine who would be coming home soon because he has lost his leg, and she had a baby, okay? and the baby had needed special formula. So while he was in the Marine Corps, they would pay for it, but VA does not pay for baby formula. Wow. So uh, now is that healing the wounds of war? You betcha, you betcha. So, and this is a good story, because I, uh, I called the public health, I called all over, and uh, the Governor Rell, no, Nancy, um, why, why, yeah, the Secretary of State heard I was looking for money for baby formula. She said, I have a check right here for you. You, because, are, you are a mover and a shaker, I know that. Well, you know, the thing about it is, is a nurse is very, very talented in seeing needs. You also have to be talented and in, in be able to address the needs. And sometimes they're not exactly what was in the books you were looking at in nursing school. It's just, the, it's, a, it just it's a rhythm of the heart. You've got the heart, let me tell you. I, uh, I, I've known you for a, a while. But I, let's, well, carrying on, you were in the United States Air Force Nursing Corps. Uh, in Vietnam from 67 to uh, 86. You were in, uh, in the Air Force. Nurse in the Air Force then, yeah. Uh, then you were in active duty as a reservist. You retired in 86. And then I, I know this, and I, I asked you if you'd be willing to talk about it. You sustained an inter injury mm -hmm. that kind of uh, slowed you down a little bit. Didn't stop you, but it slowed you down a little bit. You want to talk about that? Well, um, I was a uh a flight nurse instructor, that means that I was a flight nurse and I had a lot of hours. So people that want, nurses that wanted to learn the business, they would go up, we would take them out and we'd show them all the things they needed to know, help them understand how it went. And so on this particular day, uh, we were 500 miles off the coast of Virginia. We were, we were out of McGuire. And um, we were at 30,000 feet and the, it was a 141, which is, they call it a heavy. The door blew off, the overhead hatch blew, which caused a decompression. Mm. A mass, it's like if you, shock, if you take a bottle of soda or seltzer and you shake it all up, well that's how they have to compress the air. And then if you pop it like that, everything you know, just fizzes out, including okay, 
the nitrogen in your blood. Oh. So I was, the, I was in charge of the mission that day. So of course I got up and moved around and tried to get people settled and because it was just massive mess. Everything's blown all over the place. Um, and uh, the pilot asked me to come up and talk to the doctors on the ground because we had, we had 17 people. And when I got up there, I didn't realize that I was making absolutely no sense. But everybody who knew me told me to just go sit down. And instead of, we were right out near Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. And we could have landed there, but they wanted to go home to McGuire, which was two more hours. So at that time, we didn't know a whole lot about what happens. Mm -hmm. at, you know, you descend to 10,000 feet. But think about this. You just went through a, a bomb up there at 30,000 feet. Now you're trying to make it subsist at 10,000. You're already depleted uh, oxygen. And then for two hours. So um, we. Um, we, came, we made it back to McGuire, and uh, there were, it's no secret that active duty people are treated differently than reserve and guard, you know. Well, this was a Saturday, or Sunday, excuse me, Sunday, and uh, so what happened was they just told us to go home and come back the next day. Well, next, I, I live about 300 miles from where this happened, so I stayed overnight. The next morning, I had absolutely no feeling on my entire left side. Wow. Uh, I, I don't know if I didn't know my name, but um, my, my, some of the people I had worked with for years. So we went into a chamber. What they try to do is it's a decompression chamber. It's like Yeah, a, like a diver. Yeah, it is. It's actually the same thing. It's like, but I had the bends of the brain and spinal cord. Wow. And it was over 24 hours from the time the accident happened until I got in. So that caused a lot of damage. Right, it did. And, um, and the Air Force was not happy at that time that a, this would happen to a reservist. So they tried as much as they could to discourage me. They told me, <laughs> this is what they told me, if you can come back to your squadron, okay? I have no feeling I can, uh, if you, you know, and, and we'll, we'll forget everything. We'll, and we have a mission going in to Grenada. You want to be on that mission? And I'm sitting there saying. I can't walk. I, 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 I said, no. And they said, well, why not? I said, I can't function as a, as a crew member. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Anyhow, eventually what happened was I had, I was at that time a uh, student at the Yale School of Nursing in the master's program. And when I had to call them and tell them, they, they just energized their jets. They were, they were not very happy to hear this was happening. Hmm. And when the Air Force and any of the military wanted to come into the Yale School of Nursing to recruit, they said no. And the answer was, why not? They said, we know how you treat your people. And they told them the story. Um, eventually, I had to, um, I had to go to, uh, back to uh, Washington, D.C., to Andrews Air Force Base, where they did a lot of testing, and they determined that my problem was due to a bicycle accident I was in when I was nine years old. Really? What an insult. Yeah. And that, uh, that just got everybody's jets going. I, I mean, I am a major in the Air Force. I am a flight nurse with almost 5,000 hours. And I'm a master's student at Yale. And I, I, this is because of something that happened when I was seven years old. I, I would have to say that it was, it, it was not a very, it's a good thing I didn't realize every, all that was going on. But I had a lot of people fighting on my side. Yeah. And eventually, <laughs> this is even worse, they gave me a 30% dis disability. <laughs> and, I, and so some days I do worry, or I do think, what if we would have started, you know, PT or something, then would I be able to do any better? So I was kind of caught 
My husband was a, is a veteran, and he, he could speak mumbo jumbo, but we were getting nowhere. And, um, and at that time, we did not know, but I know now, that this was a 141 that had been um, rigged differently. They needed uh, to be able to refuel because all the things that were going on in the uh, Middle East, Spain was not allowing us to land yeah. to refuel. And so this was a, a new, new thing. And I'm just speculating there, but I think that had a lot to do with it. But I, I can say this, that being at the Yale School of Nursing, I don't think I would be here today because they would not take it all for an answer either. Yeah. You know, and I, and, and you meet people along the way. Um, I was, it was very hard because I had statistics that I really couldn't, you know. And um, so the statistics professor said that she would come in during the summer and tutor me. And then I had, I, um, they weren't paying her to do this. She did it on her own. Mm. And uh, she, we said we would go out to lunch when it was finished, if, and I passed. But it was something I could, she was very good, that I could, uh, you know, assimilate what was going on, and it wasn't a big bite. So at that luncheon, she told me, I know how the military works. She said, I was in the Army. I was in Vietnam. I was the person that did the, uh, in the emergency room and the triage at Long Bin. So I know. She said she had been in, um, she had been walking down, and you know these things went on in Vietnam, walking down the pathway to work one day and somebody just for the, the jollies threw out a hand grenade and so it blasted her and she had lost some of her hearing. No, no one would acknowledge that. So that uh, brought, she did well for herself too. I mean, she was a professor. And so she was like, if Madeline can do that, I'm gonna do as best I can too. And that's how it happened. Wow, wow. That's a, quite the story. You know, uh, I'm gonna look at your bio again here. Okay. See what else we got here. <laughs> I mean, I know you, I've known you from Connecticut because you were the uh, uh, commissioner. Commissioner, that's right. Veterans. Commissioner for Veterans Affairs. And uh, I was with Northeast Utilities at the right. time. And we, we started at Christmas in July we'd go up to Rocky Hill Veterans Home. That's kind of where you're, you, right. you, know, you hung out or whatever was your office, I'm not yeah. sure. And uh, we, we would, I've got some photographs over there. Well, uh, I think you, the, the thing about Rocky Hill was it was built in 1938. We had, a, uh, 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 we had about 1,000 patients. We had almost 350 in a, in a hospital setting. We had one of the largest domiciles for homeless. And we had a substance abuse treatment program. And, um, and I would just tell you, the first day I went to work there, I don't consider myself to be one of these kind of people, but I, I got out of my car, I walked in and said, who is in charge of cutting the grass? Because it was like, way, and, and they go, oh, he is. Uh, we had to get the, the Department of Transportation to come out. You couldn't just cut it with a lawnmower. So that's how bad it was. And the other part of it was they had, they had a 350 bed hospital with no air conditioning. No air conditioning. Um, and so my, uh, I was lucky to choose uh, my uh, deputy, or at that time was my chief of staff. He was a Navy guy, Charlie Williams. We started buying uh, for, out of our own money, uh, Air conditioners you could put in the window, so that they at least have that. Mm. But the best thing came. Now think about this. The best thing came when I'm up there on the third floor, and somebody's out there binging on it to get in. Buzz, 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 buzz. It was a, it was a woman, 
So, um, so, so somebody comes up and says, there's a lady downstairs that really wants to talk to you. I said, well, who is she? She says, she didn't give her name, but she really wants to talk to you, Commissioner. So I go downstairs. She was a patient. She had been, she's a lady vet who just, she had no, no way of supporting herself. But so she came to the home and there was nothing, I mean like Zippo, for lady vets. So this was another one. I'm just giving you the terrain. So I said to my chief of staff, find something today. So he came back, very proud of himself, and said, we have an idea. Okay, so like the shower, we're gonna put a sign there that says, woman, you know, why she's in there. I said, can you think of a more vulnerable situation than a woman, the only woman, and, and amongst about a thousand men, and there's a sign saying, I'm taking a shower? Well, well ma'am, what do you want? Yeah, that doesn't sound like a cause. We, we, got, we took care of it, but she, you know, the same thing too. Uh, one of the first days I was walking through nurses like to make rounds, so I would do this. Here's this guy sitting on his bed, crying. So I asked him what was wrong, and he was a new guy too, and he said, if this is what my life has become, I do not want to live. He was in a 10-bay open barrack room. And they, we don't, we don't cater this, man. I said, you find something for him today and let me know what it is. Now, years later, a, a, a wonderful plan that we developed. You know, I, I've been up there, I haven't been up there for the last couple of years, but the last time I was up there, I was so impressed. Every room, there's a little thing outside the, the door yes. with, the, with the picture of them and the, you know what the branch yes. of service, and they all have nice rooms, and it, it, it's, we, we got it, a, it's an amazing, and this is, a, this is a state run. Yes. Connecticut state run hospital. We were very fortunate to get a, 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 a nice, over $50 million grant from the VA. No, none of the people before me ever tried this. Mm. So uh, coming from the Yale School of Nursing, we know how to do grants. <laughs> so um, so uh, someone told me about it on Monday. I was at a conference in Maine. I called up my chief of staff and everybody. I told them what, what we had to do because the deadline was set at the end of the week or we'd have to wait a whole year. Okay. So my husband and I came home. They had everything going and, we, and I put... Charlie on the train to Washington to make sure it was hand delivered. We came up number one in the nation for funding. All right. Okay, this is a better sign though. So I am so thrilled. See, the, the state has to make a third of the, but I didn't know I had to ask. So, so I get a call from the governor's office. Well, we're very thrilled to hear about this, but did, did we give you permission to, to uh, do this? And I'm sitting at my desk and I'm thinking, be very careful. What, <laughs> what you say next? I said, no, but do we have to give this money back? And he said, no, I don't think so. We'll find a way. <laughs> and we did. And now it's, it's beautiful. And, and the best part about this is it's named after a friend, Sergeant John Levito who was a Medal of Honor recipient. I have a picture of him over there. Yes. And he, matter of fact, that in my office or whatever you want to call it, my den, yeah, I do have the same picture that it would, one of three thousand copies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have it hanging in my office, and uh, but I have some other photos here, and I, I think my partner is going to bring it over. Well, come on, John, come on, come on, camera. She, John does, was, she doesn't like to be on camera. She, John Levito, was the only enlisted man in the Air Force to receive. Yes. My hero. Now he was in Rocky Hill. Yes, he was. In fact, on my when I applied for VA benefits, he was one of the approvers. Then he worked as the deputy, uh, as the chief of staff. And then he got sick. And he lived there, and that's where he died. Where did he die? At Rocky Hill, in his home. He had, we had a home for the. Oh, you, I didn't know you had a different homes. Yeah, we had up on the hill. Early back in the 30s, they had 
people didn't have cars to come to work, so the doctors lived up there. Yeah. And now, very good news, Easter Seals has renovated the most of them, and they're using them for veterans just getting out of the military that need a few months to get there. I'd say Rocky Hills is a special place in my heart. Well, John, this when we had the dedication, uh, he had passed on by then. And um, reading his material, his, we learned that he had, he was a loadmaster on a gunship out at night, and they had a flare that they would check the drift before they, these gunshot ships could just do a whole football field in one pass. They had so many rounds coming out of it. And they would, they would put out a fluorescent um, flare to check the drift. On this particular night, just as the guy was supposed to be shooting that flare out, they had uh, fire from below. It hit and it went back in where they had all that ammunition. And as John said, I said, so he ran back there thinking, you have only a few seconds before it will ignite. He picked it up with his hands. Of course, they were burning. Then he couldn't get it. So he's under his body, inching his way to the door. And they got it out before it really went. They caught a lot of the, the plane looked pretty bad later, but all the, everybody on it was saved. And, and, and it said that he was aerovac to the U.S. Air Force Hospital at Tachikawa, Japan. That's where I was. I didn't, I, and it's. Did you read him there? No. Oh, you I never knew it, that. So I said to the rest of the nurses, you know, 42 bullet holes, 42, 52, 22. We, we didn't really know their names. We just know we had to work our self to death to make sure that they could get home. And he, he came home. Yeah, Medal of Honor, United States Air Force. Uh, tremendous story, tremendous story. You know, Rock, Rocky Hill is just full of good stories, you know. But making it the John Levito, everybody was like, whoa. So th now, okay, they're telling and retelling his story. It will not be forgotten. No, no. Well, that's, no, that's why we do this. This yeah. is why we do Central Florida Salute YouTube. And it's speaking of uh, people, uh, this one here is a dear friend of mine and yours. He was he worked much uh, with NU vets. He and I and uh, uh, Murdy Terry were the three amigos that kind of got it started. And we brought in every everybody else, but uh, that was a parade in uh, Hartford. Yes, I yeah. know. Um, and unfortunately, we lost Al about a year yeah. ago. You know, but uh, I, his last name was Philibert. I used to call him Philibert. <laughs> and he used to say to me, hey, amigo. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. This, uh, is, this is the same picture, but it's a little different. Yeah, I look yeah. a little younger there. <laughs> well, we both. I finally made, um, I finally, the, the hat, Air Force changed its hat. Every other service, when you were a major, you could have the, then we, we finally got thunderbolts and lightning on our hats when we made major, but I went on to become colonel. So. Speaking of uh, which, uh, <laughs> you remember this? Yes, I was, the tre I was the treasurer for the Vietnam Women's Memorial. And um, I think I told you about my professor uh, who, you know, helped me through and it was was uh, did triage in one of the most the busiest army hospitals and when i saw this um i thought of her nobody knows her story i thought of others that i had missed uh, met and i and so i became very active in the vietnam women's memorial but but it was uh in the beginning it was kind of uh, controversial because it only had one a statue of one army nurse. And so we had a competition. And this was Glenda, Glenda Goodacre did this. And it is, I will tell you a good story. Of course, we're proud of the one in Washington. And I think some days when we were fighting up on the hill and things were not looking good for us, we would just go down there and be with them. They would give us, they would give us inspiration. And on this particular day, um, 
Marsha, who's here, and uh, Joan Fury and I were there. And uh, there came a group of young, maybe high school, maybe five or six of them, and they were all around, you know. And part of in being part of that memorial is to see how people react and in, in enjoy it or what they have to say. So I went up and around, and I soon, soon, soon learned they were blind. They were blind. Hmm. And they had an interpreter with them, and they wanted to touch them. And of course, how they, they ran there. And they said, uh, the casualty that's there, that the nurse is holding, has a bandage across his eye. And one young man said, is he blind? And they said, we don't know. And it was killing me, and it's killing me now to think about how many blind boys have been put on planes and sent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, wait, wait. So uh, they put their hand on the face of the nurse, and one stepped back and said, this is the face of a strong woman. So I went over to Joan and Marsha and I say, if even the blind can see, we have done our job. You know, like I said, uh, I, I hold you way up here in regards, but I also I, have another lady, uh, veteran, mm -hmm. who if when you're down this way again, or if you have some time, I live in Leesburg, which is not really that far from here. It's about 45, 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. I do have a, a young, well, a younger veteran, I should mm -hmm. say. Uh, her name is Catherine Wilkes. Uh, she served in the United States Army, then went over to the Navy, and she took care of the worst of the worst in Iraq, and I, I think Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And she's on my YouTube channel. Well, before you go, I want to give you something for her. Okay. But I, I, I know she's going to say, why didn't you tell me? And I wanted to come down and meet her. She is working now. She, she's uh, unbelievable. She had an Afghanistan hat on, yeah, you know. And somebody came over to her and said, hey, is that your father's hat? Oh. Boy, you, to, uh, uh, you don't know Catherine. Even, even in the VA, they say, are you waiting for your husband? No, I'm the veteran. You know, it's, it, we went through a transition there. Um, I have something for you, but I'm going to show you uh, this patch. Yes, I see that, yeah. Women proudly serve. That was designed by my daughter. Oh. And we have some pins now for this. I'll, let me give you one. Yeah. If you have another one, I would give it to Catherine. Or unless you want to come up to Leesburg and you can give it to her. <laughs> no, she I, I she have, would love to meet you. I have a couple, so I'll, I, I can give them to you. Okay. And but I have something for you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about this a little bit later. But since we're talking about nurses and everything, my partner Sue and I have done a lot of shows, and uh, we do Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Gulf War. I've interviewed people from, who were at the Bridge of the River Kwai. Oh, wow, 1936 yeah. Olympics, uh, Medal of Honor, uh, people, you know, awarded Medal of Honor, uh, prisoners of war Afghan, uh, from Vietnam and uh, Korea, what have you. We even did a frogman who led the way for Navy SEALs, then we did a Navy <laughs> SEAL. But there's this one fellow I became pretty good friends with lately. He is, his name is Michael Hertz. Hertz. Michael Hertz is a Vietnam veteran, the United States Army. Uh, he came home and you know, we, we all need to adjust sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And he found his way through music. Uh -huh. And I'm a fan of his. And I told him, all, I always tell everybody about you because you, you, you're my hero. <laughs> did you tell him I was taller? <laughs> well, you did used to, you, you were taller at one yeah, time. Was, yeah, was, and then it just ground yeah. me down. Yeah. Well, he wrote this, uh, these songs and sang these songs. Oh my. It's Midnight in July. It's all about uh, Vietnam, uh, clearing the field mm -hmm. uh, for the helicopters and this. But this is the one, he wanted to make sure you got this one. He says, because it, it's, it, this is very special to him, this song. It's called Angels in the Storm.
Oh, wow. It's all about nurses in Vietnam. Well, thank you. And we're, I'm going to, we're the lady vets are having a get together. There's so many men here. So in, inside there, by the way, I put his phone number. Okay. I asked him if I could do that. And he said, I, yeah. Uh, and I'm, I, he, he really wanted you to, I, I, just, I, oh, to, well, I told him I was going to give you. it to you. And he said, he, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 okay. you got to. All right, yeah. I will, so I will His name is Michael Hurt. You can see him on the YouTube, too, by the way. He does all those songs pretty much on the YouTube. But uh, one, one thing that really puts us, we bonded us, was my uncle, yes. Uncle Ted, and it's Uncle Ted's greenhouse. Oh, yeah. When my uncle passed, uh, he wanted to do something for them boys, as he says, you know. I want to do something for the veterans. He was a World War II, seriously wounded on the beaches uh, in, in D-Day, and uh, shot in the leg, got up after taking out a machine gun, was on his way to take a pillbox. Flack came in, took, you know, took his eye out. That was it, he was done as far as the military was concerned. But uh, he wanted to do something, so he, I, I didn't know it until he, after he passed that I was the executor of his estate. And um, he told me, all the time, Bobby, I got to do something for them guys. I'm going to do something for them guys. I think he left like 130000 gave You gave us a good... Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I, first of all, that he was picking fruit in Connecticut, and three months later he's on the beaches of Normandy. Yeah, he, uh, he went to, uh, uh, where did he go? The Yukon for horticulture. And uh, he loved gardening, and you know, and yes, he, he was—he was my uncle, my best friend. In fact, if you go on my YouTube, I just came back from Normandy. That was my bucket list for him and I to go together. But unfortunately, the Lord needed him, so he took him. But I finally got there after 52 years. I just got there. But anyway, uh, he had left money to the, what was called the Bennett Center. Right. It wasn't there no more. I, I remember you calling me. I, remember, I said no. Uh, uh, I'm not, <laughs> but it wasn't at Bridgeport Hospital? No, it was the Bennett Center in Stanford, and oh, then Stanford. it was supposed to go to some place in Norwalk, and that place closed, and then the lawyer says to me, I don't know what to do with it. I says, well, I do. We're going to send it up to Rocky Hill Veterans Home and Hospital. And uh, first the lawyer said, well, your, your, your family may contest it. I says, nobody in my family is going to contest it. Not for my uncle. This is my uncle's wishes. They wanted it, and he, it's going to happen. And I went up and saw you and said, Linda, my uncle wants to make a donation. And you're the one that came up with, well, well tell me about your uncle. And I told you all about how his love for gardening. And this is what's up there now. Uncle you know? Ted's greenhouse. Uncle Ted's greenhouse. And from what I understand, yep. people there get, get all the, the vegetables. Right. Started veterans, in here. The veterans, uh, it, it was built uh, to be a working greenhouse, and I, they're doing that now. But uh, as, as I've heard, they start their little plants in there, and then we used to have, oh, back in the 1930s when this place was built, Rocky Hill, they had a big garden. Mm. And there's still a strip back there that, I, that they uh, Grow them in the ground. Yep, I heard that there's there. It, it's there. I got pictures of that. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. And now that now I mean most of it feeds uh, well not only the the people at Rocky Hill but it feeds a lot of homeless I hear. I think that when I was commissioner, um, I had worked as a nurse with homeless people. That's how I really got into it. And um, at Christmas time, people would give us more than we really needed. But on one particular uh, year, we called up um, the uh, one of the homes there for the, that took children and, and mothers, and and um, we went up with some mufflers and hats and and uh, gloves, and we're there, and we're, it's it's uh, it's all kinds of people, the mothers, the kids, and everything. And um, this little girl, when we came in, she was so excited because one of the churches down the street, it was her birthday, and she was waiting for the birthday cake. She thought that's what it was. But we let everybody uh, 
other kids take it, okay? And this little girl came up to me and she said, can I take one for my mom? She doesn't have any clubs either. Think about that. So we made it the next Christmas. We brought them all out to Rocky Hill. And the veterans were like, they would get little things they want to give them. It was a wonderful evening. It had a couple, we did that about two or three times. I have to say it was, it was uh, the, the veterans that lit up their holiday. But it also lit up mine, and I think the we would get the bus would go around. We had one of our guys got dressed up like a, you know, an elf, and, and they we would bus them back down, uh, and uh, it became something. So Toys for Tots would bring town toys for them. So it was a wonderful, wonderful um, collective Christmas. Yeah, you've done some amazing things. One, one thing that uh, I do remember, and I haven't been in Connecticut for a long time, uh, was uh, Stand Down. And, and uh, I, I don't know of anybody else that does it the way you guys did it. Well, you know, it's I changed. mean, you, you had the driver's license, whatever. Talk yeah, about well, it. no, see, it, um, a, a part of my knowing about Stand Down was. Vietnam Veterans of America sent me to San Diego. That's where all this started. And it was tremendous. And Navy in San Diego supported it, everything. Yes, you got everything from uh, a haircut uh, to clean clothes. You, and we got some people uh, got their, vet, their benefits. And one of the things was that we even had a court for misdemeanors or to have your uh, licenses um, restored. I, I have to say, it was we had everything that we thought they could possibly need. And, and then when the judge came, he would have court for some of those misdemeanors and, and fines and stuff like that. And I think uh, we would bring them from, we'd bust them in from all over the state. They had pickups of like some, but it was, it was they did, in fact, my sisters are here and they, they were there cooking chicken one year. <laughs> But the thing about it was is that everybody there, the people that were coming for help and the people that were providing help, the atmosphere was just, just I remember, joyous. I remember. Yeah. But uh, we've kind of reminisced quite a bit about Rocky Hill. But Linda Schwartz is now the treasurer for the VB. How did this happen? And uh, tell me a little about your job. And uh, Okay, well... Um, I've been a member of Vietnam Veterans of America for 35 years. And because I'm a nurse and because I came, I don't know if you remember this, you might. There was a, it was a very, very bad winter. And in Milford, one of the high-end high communities, a Vietnam veteran was found frozen to death behind a dumpster. I, I just couldn't handle that. So um, we started talking about what will we do about homeless. Now I was I was a trustee of the Department of Veterans Affairs at that time, and I brought it up. And they said there are no homeless people, no homeless veterans in con Connecticut. Huh. Then the, the then commissioner said, I think I know there's one. He lives on the. He likes it there. He likes to live under the bridge. We wow. had we had we did have one bridge, but by where I lived in Oxford, he was in Seymour. He lived underneath the bridge. His family had money, but he would not come out, and he died there. So when I we got another, um, we got another uh, Commissioner Harper, and he was bringing up that we have so many of these guys have little things hanging over them for the courts. Well, VVA had sent me out to San Diego for to learn the ropes. I said, well, have you ever heard of Stand Down? Hmm. And when I told him, he was like totally and completely enthralled. He called everybody together. I didn't think we put, could put something together with only a four or five months. We did it. And it was a three day. So that people came in, <laughs> we were able to get them, you know, they, they're, everything they needed and, and some uh, actual, you know, hands on getting uh, some help. And uh, 
uh, I remember uh, at that time I was the night nurse, okay? The, we, we had to have them at, at night and uh, one of the veterans had a, had a grand mal seizure in the tent, so the other nurse, Joanne Bloom and I went in there and uh, I, I remember this, we, were, we had the situation under control and I said, does anybody here know him? And someone said, no, but he's my guest. <laughs> he's my guest? Well, um, eventually that guy came to uh, Rocky Hill and uh, lived out a wonderful life. But it was a, a great success. And yeah. it got a lot of the people moving. And it, this was just as we were beginning to look at what was going on in the Middle East. But um, for me, the fact that Vietnam veterans were, were starting this and getting it going, and it's been going since 1992, and they're going to have another one. Good, good, It's good. different now because life is different. They are holding them in different parts of the state. So we, and, you know, <coughs> bringing the Excuse same, me. and you're going to be using those those agencies and that support in your community, so there they are, to get to know them. And, uh, that, that's a good idea. It, 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 was, it works well. Yeah, so, you need to do more for homeless. Well, back, I'm sure in, your, in the state of Florida, I know uh, in the state of California, but that's where it originated in San Diego, but it's time to look at, again at what, what can we do and what's meaningful. We were able to get jobs for people, the courts, driver's license restored, stuff like that, all in one. And you didn't have to look for a parking place. You just <coughs> got on the bus. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Homeless is, is a big problem. Yes, since 1992. Yeah. I see you are in, in uh, the Ohio and the Connecticut uh, Hall of Fame, Veterans Hall of Fame. Right. Yeah, you deserve it too, my friend. You know, uh, uh, you uh, served in the Connecticut, well, the Connecticut Affairs Policy and Planning. Yes, prior that, no, that's the Assistant Secretary oh, okay. of Veterans Affairs. And this is a good story in a way, because I didn't ask for the job. But hmm. when you're the commissioner, you don't go home till they've finished with the work, okay? Thank you. And I, live about a, I lived about an hour away from home. But it was like 6.30, 7 o'clock, and I'm trying to get it done so it'll be there for the people in the morning, and the telephone rings on my desk, the commissioner's desk. So I answer, I say, Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs, Office of the Commissioner. They go, we want to talk to the commissioner. I said, you are talking to the commissioner. <laughs> You're Linda Schwartz? Yes, I am. Well, this is the White House calling, and we've been talking about you. And I'm thinking to myself, I just sent a bunch of things in to ask them to send letters to people for different things. I'm thinking, oh, maybe they, I asked for too much. Uh, and, and they started talking again, and I, I was getting the gist. Of, they're not talking. I said, this isn't about El Meadows. Sorry, El, because we had put him in for a letter. Who's El Meadows? Oh, sorry. So she said, well, the president has been reviewing your file. The president? And would like to ask you to be the assistant secretary. Would like to nominate you. That's how they say. So, so nominate you. But that doesn't mean it's a sure thing. Right. So um, I said, who is this really? <laughs> <laughs> it was for real. It was for real. She said, I assure you, ma'am. <laughs> um, the part that was funny was going home and telling my husband that I had this. Oh, by the way, the president called me. Well, I? <laughs> he said, and this is what he said without missing a beat, is this a paying job or is another one of those volunteer things? <laughs> we get a lot of volunteer jobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, the one I got right now is a volunteer job. I, I was, I couldn't hardly believe it. Um, but it, um, it was, it was probably, it was the summer when things were so bad in the VA. They have 16 presidential appointees and 14 of them were fired. Wow. That's the whole thing that happened in um, Arizona. And so I came in 
and most of the people were new. And I, I remember, this is how he started off, in a quiet way. We're having this meeting, and meeting the secretary. He's uh, talking, and then he said, what would you like to say? I said, well, listen, I want you to know that I'm going to be late. I'm going to be lobbying you hard and heavy that the state of West Virginia has three visions. That's, you know, territorial, VA territories. Three in that little state of West Virginia. And it's really breaking. It's, you're, you're missing a lot of chances. And he goes, what do you want me to do about it? Make it one. <laughs> that it belongs to one visitor, not, not, not another, not to others. And I think, I know he probably thought, what's she talking about? <laughs> but we did. We did. West Virginia is this, you know, next to Ohio, but somebody uh, carved VA up into three administrative areas in one yeah. little. I consider that one of the best things. The other, the other thing is that. Uh, the, the Secretary is McDonald. He, he had just come from being the president of Procter & Gamble. So he really knew, and it, it was fortuitous that he knew this, because VA had a terrible reputation. And he yeah. was trying to, trying to uh, change it, make the people that are doing, and they have done a, a good job. I, I still use the VA. And they're much more uh, human. They're much more down to earth. And they ha they, they, uh, a lot of them, if they don't know, they'll get back to you. And that's a very different thing. You know, I've heard that too a long time ago about the VA. Ah. But you know, my experience with them is, is, is it's amazing. I mean, you know, I get you free glasses. You know, uh, they, they did my hearing and. Uh, yeah. Checking your hearing, whatever. Any, any, and they have the thing nowadays, if, uh, if you have to go more than so many miles, they'll refer you to a doctor in your community. McDonald. That was him. He, he saw it. He, he saw the law and used it. And many people have benefited from that. And one of the other things is I, as a nurse, was not too excited about telemedicine. Okay? I thought, no. <laughs> Uh, do you talk to television? Used to be to the television. Used to be a a question on the mental health exams. <laughs> so anyhow, so, <coughs> as I mentioned before, I uh, am from Ohio, and I had to go back to Ohio. I was still the assistant secretary, and um, we visited a community-based outpatient clinic in Parma, Ohio. I went into the office of the telemedicine tele nurse, and her, her um, purview, her area, started in Toledo and went all the way to Youngstown. That's a that's that's a lot of miles. That's a lot, of, and but she had um, telemetry in the homes that needed it. She had the video conferencing, and then you had to have a telephone. Yeah. And um, she had rave, rave, rave reviews because veterans didn't have to get up. They didn't have to drive to Cleveland. They didn't have to look for a, a uh, parking place, which would give you elevated blood pressure. <laughs> and, and, and it was more like they could sit down in their kitchen, have a cup of coffee with yeah, their nurse. They didn't have to bother somebody for a ride. Right. You know, so, of, you know. And, you know, she, she really had an excellent rapport with each and every one of those. And, and I, now my uh, primary care provider does do telehealth once in a while. And um, it's just more inclusive, more using, not, it's not the, uh, what do I want to say? To, to come in and be treated like a patient. All that, that we really, our veterans needed. And the other thing is, there are so many different kinds of things. This idea of, if you, it, you know, for example, I can, I can e email. There's um, um, secure mail. 
to my uh, nurse practitioner and say, listen, I'm running out of this. Do, do you still want me to take it? Because if you do, I'll, I need it to be renewed. About a half hour later, renewed. Hmm. So, uh, Times take, have changed. Yes, they have. But so is our military. You know, uh, my job when I was there was basically to be responsible for looking at the systems that were bringing the casualties back from Iraq and Afghanistan to their homes. Over there in DOD land, they thought they were bringing back to big hospitals. No, no. I told you about the, the lady whose husband, the Marine was coming home and she, you know, she was, needed the baby uh, formula. She lived in a town that was very, very small. No, they're coming home. Really? You mean you're not? No. And so I remember this Air Force guy, you mean we have to, you know, revise our trajectory? I'd say, yes, because there's not a lot of beds. It's not like after World War II, and it's not at like um, the Korean War. People, there's, there, and people need, they were going home, but some, some of the wounds, I've seen wounds, but um, they have a lot of grit. Yeah. And they, they do reach down. I, I, had a, uh, I had a young man that I knew before he went. No, I didn't, yeah, didn't know until he came home. He lost both of his uh, legs below the knee. No, above the knee. And he was a Marine. And he was being taken care of by the Marines, which is a lot different than being taken care of by the VA. Anyhow, uh, he, uh, he wanted to get back in the Marine Corps. I wanted to be back in the Air Force because that would mean I'm just as whole as I was before this happened to me. And I, uh, somebody called me down and said, you need to talk to him. And I told him my story. And, and uh, I said it was the, one of the saddest days of my life when I was told I couldn't get back in the Air Force. So on the day they told him, he couldn't get back in the Marine Corps. He came to see me. He what? He came to see me. Oh. Well, I want you to know, it was not an easy struggle. But you know, those Marines have a lot of heart. Yeah. So uh, he got a job, think about this, as a UPS driver. <laughs> I know, I can still do it. But, but the point was, um, they uh, he's one of those that they built the houses for, and it was all yeah, yeah. very nice, we, we, very we've, nice. We've done a couple of those. So somebody uh, talked him into the fact that he was pretty good with computer skills. So that he uh, w worked and now has his own business. Great, great, great. And he did come back to tell me I have my own business. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of stories like that. I, I did a show once, and I don't think it's on my YouTube. I don't know if I even have a copy of it. But this guy uh, was a, a pilot. It's, I have to be in a Well, I think it's about time we've got to wrap it up anyway. Yeah, all right, let's do that. Yeah, but any, anyway, to, wrap, to finish the story, this guy... Uh, was a, a pilot, and he, and he was transporting the planes back and forth. You know, he was a fighter pilot. Uh -huh. And the plane lost trim, which was the ability to... Yeah. He could have put it down in a mobile home park. Oh. But he said, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so he, he fought the plane, got past the mobile home park, parachuted, I think, like 30 or 60 feet. You know, woke up in the hospital. They had removed one leg. Mm. And... Uh, after being there for a week or so, or two weeks, I don't know what it was, uh, they told him that he had a sense of, his name is Frank, he had a sense of humor. The nurse comes in and says, uh, we're gonna have to take the other leg. He says, uh, you have to sign this so we can dispose of it. He says, you ain't disposing of it, I want it bronze with the other one. I want them for bookends. And he fought with the Navy because he wanted to get back and fight, you know, on status. He's, he said, put me in the bay of that, that aircraft carrier and I'll beat you up to the top. So, to, so did this a young man. And that was, it is, it's like, you ain't going back. So um, 
there's a lot of work to be done. And so when you talk about healing the wounds war, it can be anything from baby formula to... <laughs> Too. Very well put, my dear. Very well put. Listen, I know there's a lot going on here today at the, uh, the convention. Yes. And you have to make an appearance here and there. Yes, I do. And you also have uh, some company with your sisters, I hear. Yes. I didn't know your husband was a, a veteran. I, know, I yes. never met your husband. No, he, was, he had a restaurant called Noah's in Stonington. And uh, he was there night and day. But... Well, you tell him I said hello and tell him he's got a terrific wife oh, because okay. she's a terrific person and you're a difference maker. That's my kind of people. Well, thank you very much. But we have to say goodbye, Linda. All right. Well, you ready? I'm ready. All right. To all our veterans out there, active military and their families, we salute you for all you do. Till next time. <laughs>